Over the last year, I reviewed the scientific literature of 11 supplements and their effect on a number of outcomes from heart disease to sleep to cognitive effects and more. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief breakdown from my findings across all these supplements and grade them based on two criteria. One, what is the strength of evidence across the studies that I analyzed? And two, what is the effect size? How much of an effect this supplement actually provides? That said, know that the conclusions are limited to the outcomes assessed. So if you take taurine for sciatica pain and I'm discussing metabolic syndrome, know that the conclusion is only applying to metabolic syndrome. Finally, if you want more specifics on any of these supplements, including having the data broken down for you and access to the studies, I'll link my individual videos for all of these supplements in the pinned comment. Okay, let's dive in. Omega-3s for heart health. I analyzed nine studies, many of which were meta-analyses, including up to 30 studies, on the effect that omega-3s have on various forms of heart disease, like heart attack, stroke, and so on. Throughout all these studies, there seems to be good evidence that omega-3s in the form of fish oil or otherwise reduces heart disease risk in people with heart disease. The effect is small to moderate, but present across many analyses, including more rigorous analyses like the Cochrane Library. Unfortunately, there's also some evidence pointing to omega-3s can increase the risk of irregular heart rhythms, known as fibrillation. That point is still debated, however. Interestingly, even with this possible issue, there is still an overall protective effect of omega-3s on cardiovascular disease. So everything considered, I scored omega-3s as a B for heart health. Glycine for sleep. I analyzed all the human studies that I could find to date on glycine supplementation on sleep across four studies, all of them indicated effectiveness of glycine for sleep. However, it might be important for you to know that most of the studies were industry affiliated. In addition, while there's clearly consistency across studies, the effect sizes in these studies were honestly relatively small. So I scored glycine as a C for sleep based on the current evidence. Taurine for metabolic syndrome. For taurine, I went over one meta-analysis focused on a metabolic syndrome, which is essentially a, a grouping of disorders from diabetes to obesity to cardiovascular disease. In that analysis, including 25 randomized controlled trials, the researchers identified taurine supplementation as providing multiple benefits from reductions in blood pressure, uh, reduced blood triglycerides, and a likely effect of reducing blood sugar. The effects were, again, mild, but since the effect was across multiple measures, that's not so bad. So that's a point in favor of taurine. However, there's also a lot of heterogeneity or inconsistency across studies. So I think that there's probably some more work that needs to be done to find out why studies are so all over the place. For example, Taurine may provide more benefit to people with heart disease than those who are obese only. We don't know that yet. Even so, it does seem that taurine is a benefit, so I scored it a B for metabolic syndrome, only detracting because of the need for more data to tease out who might benefit more than others. Astaxanthin for skin. Now, if you're thinking, why did you look at astaxanthin for skin instead of something like longevity or some other outcome? I hear you, but this is what I was interested in, so here we are. Although, I did cover astaxanthin on longevity for the Physionic Insiders. If you know, you know. It's linked in the description. Anyway, there's one analysis of 11 studies, and overall, across three measurements of skin, health, and age, astaxanthin seem to provide a benefit in two out of three measures. Unfortunately, the analysis was weakened because, again, 
there's a lot of inconsistency across studies and not all the studies were, well, of the highest quality. I also don't think that the effect is very big. So all considered, it seems that astaxanthin might help our skin, but it wouldn't be my go-to and the research needs some work. So I demoted astaxanthin to a D for skin based on the current research. That may change over time as we get more studies. Lion's mane for cognitive function. This one is tricky. Lion's mane, a mushroom, has been touted as having several benefits, but I focused on uh, my attention on the cognitive effects. Across eight studies in different groups of people, lion's mane had disappointing results for people who are young and healthy. There's one study that indicates a pure benefit, but if you look at the effect size as measured, it's minuscule. Other studies indicate improvements in some cognitive measures and worsening of others, or they just show no effect at all. However, there is a bit better evidence when looking at people who are suffering from some form of cognitive impairment, like dementia or sleeping problems, among others. So I'm inclined to split the score here. For healthy individuals with good sleep, no other cognitive obstructions, the evidence is very weak. So I'd give it a D. On the other hand, for people who have some sort of cognitive dysfunction from as little as sleep problems to more serious situations like a full-blown dementia, I'd promote the evidence to a C. For those that uh, might comment that they swear by lion's mane, keep in mind here that there aren't many human studies, so I'm hamstrung by the limitations of the data. Beta alanine for performance. For this one, I analyzed two meta-analyses, which included up to 40 studies. And these analyses concluded pretty convincingly that beta alanine does improve physical performance, but the effect is pretty small. And the effect really only applies with certain physical activities. Any exercise or movement that is intense and lasts for more than 30 seconds, but is too intense to last above 10 minutes. So something like sprints that can be done for a few minutes, but exhaust the muscles would be a good example. The evidence around beta alanine is robust and often pretty well done but because of the small effect, I couldn't give it an A, so I demoted it to a B. It is good, but it's not the best or even necessary in many situations. Creatine for performance. Speaking of performance supplements, let's discuss creatine. I actually looked at creatine for older individuals and the effect supplementation has on bone and muscle mass as well as strength. Don't let uh, the uh, thumbnail fool you. It's true that uh, one of the analyses indicated no effect of creatine for bone health, but I explained why that might be the case. I'll leave the details for that video if you're interested. On the other hand, another analysis indicated creatine was beneficial for muscle mass and strength, even in older individuals. So if we pair that with the mountain of evidence in favor of creatine for younger individuals too, there's excellent science indicating it provides a moderate benefit to physical performance, at least resistance training and high intensity performance. Because of the wealth of evidence and the moderate effect across multiple metrics, I'd give creatine the gold medal, an A. Radiola rosea for cognitive function. I analyzed every human study on rhodiola rosea for the brain. The literature is scarce at this point of this recording. Still, I tried it myself and although utterly unscientific, I had a wonderful experience using it. That said, several studies on rhodiola rosea are horrible quality. I mean, poor methodology uh, and improper statistical analyses used, which weakens the confidence in the scientific evidence behind rhodiola rosea for cognition. There are, however, a few well-done studies that still indicate benefit, and considering the effect size and the wide-reaching benefits, it is enticing to give it uh, one of the higher scores. Yet, in total, while I had a great experience, there is still limited formal evidence in humans to back it. So I'm 
knocking it down two grades to a C. And honestly, I'm even tempted to knock it down three. Although I do think that as more better quality evidence comes available, that rating will change. Natokinase for cardiovascular health. I'm going to subtype this one because I reviewed eight studies on natokinase in respect to cardiovascular disease. And in one respect, I find that the evidence is extremely weak. And in another, I find it all right. So the two subtypes are reversing plaque buildup in arteries, and the other is on measures like blood pressure. The first, plaque in the arteries, there are two studies looking at atherosclerosis, that's a plaque in the arteries reversal. One study shows a pretty strong positive effect, and the other finds no effect. The one that found no effect was methodologically more rigorous than the one that found an effect. But they may have used too low of a dose, which may explain the lack of an effect. Overall, the evidence surrounding plaque reversal leaves a tremendous amount to be desired. On the other hand, multiple studies indicate natokinase mildly improves blood pressure and might improve a few other areas of cardiovascular health, albeit by a very small amount. On the plaque reversing front, if I'm assessing the amount as well as the quality of the science, I'd give it an F. I'm not saying it couldn't have an effect, but we have no strong unbiased proof. In fact, we have uh, a little bit of poor proof. On the other hand, I'd give natokinase on blood pressure a C and the other cardiovascular outcomes a D. There are admittedly a few studies that indicate effectiveness, but if you look at the effect sizes, it's small. And aside from blood pressure, there's a lot of uncertainty about the other measures. Funny story that I'm reminded of just now. Uh, I remember I covered the topic at the request of a physionic insider, and they ultimately got angry with me for my less than enthusiastic appraisal of the supplement that they were taking. So they told me that I had a lot to learn and essentially said that I didn't know what I was talking about in, well, let's say uh, less polite ways. Uh, they then promptly left the community immediately after that and before we could discuss. I found it funny because I had spent a month collecting all the studies that I could find, pouring over the data, collecting the funding information for each study, and making sure to be extra careful with my appraisal. And my reward, if you will, uh, was a loss in income and insults from the person not in the field telling me that I didn't know what I was doing in my own field and that I should get more educated. So I suppose I'll need to get another PhD. There is a tragic comedy there, although I doubt Shakespeare would have written a play about it. Anyway, on to the next one. Lutein and zeaxanthin for eye health. This was an area that I knew very little about. So I went out to educate myself through the analysis of six studies and scientific reviews. These uh, two molecules are really interesting. I'd encourage that you check out the dedicated video on them. I go over what they are and their mechanisms, as well as, of course, the data. Anyway, there is great consistency across studies that I analyzed. Not only that, the effects are pretty impressive with uh, not only long-term eye protection, but some improvements in eye function. I'll just uh, state plainly, this is another A in my books. And to clarify, all the studies use lutein and zeaxanthin together because they work slightly differently, but work synergistically. Check out my video for the details. Like I said, it's linked in the pinned comment. Berberin for metabolic disorder. This was also a bit of a roller coaster because one analysis that I went over uh, was so bad that I chucked it in the trash and even contacted the journal that it was published in because, well, it contains so many errors. Then we went over another analysis on the topic, a better one, although also not perfect. And it seemed that berberin is a benefit in reducing different clinical markers like HbA1c, blood sugar, improving insulin sensitivity, and reducing blood fats. There were some uh, funny moments in that investigation. Again, I'll point you to the dedicated video. At any rate, I ended up limiting my conclusions to what these studies focused on, people with type 2 diabetes. It might also apply to people without diabetes, but that's unconfirmed. 
Overall, berberine seemed to have a lot of studies behind it, but not all the studies are a gold standard randomized control trial because there's uh, no placebo control. So I'm tending towards a C on this one, but I wouldn't be mad if we were to upgrade it to a B. That rating may rise as more better quality studies emerge. Okay, let's do uh, one more thing. Out of the top grades, A through C, let's say, how would I prioritize these if you had a limited capacity to buy these supplements? If you're looking for just one supplement, creatine has my vote for president. If you want more, the three A tier, so creatine, lutein, and zeaxanthin are a strong choice. Then from there, likely omega-3 at a lower dose, around one gram or less. And then from there, nothing. I'd skip the rest. Not because they don't work, but because if you have a limited budget or just don't want to be taking pills and powders, these will provide the biggest bang for your buck. If you did want to invest more in addition to the four already mentioned, I'd aim for taurine. Again, keep in mind, I'm limiting the mentions based on the outcomes assessed. We'll see if these get promoted in score next year as I continue my investigations into other outcomes. But guess what? I have looked at other supplements in the past and I'll link another list for you right here.